Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit a high rail layout in California that incorporates some movie magic. Go into the hills of West Virginia and meet a man who literally saved a town with a railroad. And visit a husband and wife who restored and operate a piece of Western history. Now for true rail fans, one of the most beautiful locomotives ever built was the Alco PA. A first generation diesel designed and built in the 1940s, the Alco PA was a powerful and some say beautiful monster of a locomotive. It's a locomotive that's long gone, but it's on its way back. Introduced in 1946, the Alco PA was one of the post-World War II diesel locomotives designed for high-speed passenger service. Not the only diesel built in America, but it was certainly one of the most distinctive and most powerful. Alco was short for the American Locomotive Company in Schenectady, New York. The PA meant it was a locomotive with a cab unit and was built to pull passenger trains. General Electric, a partner in the manufacturing process, supplied the electrical equipment. It was a partnership playing catch-up in the diesel locomotive business. Steam trains, Alco's bread and butter, were dying. So the Alco PA diesel was quick to jump from concept and design to rolling down the track. Jim Boyd is an author and an Alco expert. Diesels actually replace steam locomotives on one primary factor, manpower. Steam locomotives were the standard of the era, but they required a lot of people to keep them going. Uh, not just twice as many men in the crew, uh, they required a lot of surface support, coaling towers, water facilities, all of which had to be manned. Huge back shops, and it was pure and simple manpower. Actually, the PA was not a unique design. It was, in truth, based upon the Fairbanks Morris Erie built that was being constructed on the floor of the GE plant at Erie, Pennsylvania. When Alco came to GE with this big new 16-cylinder turbocharged engine of the same horsepower, they needed a package that they could put that new engine in and do it in a hurry. Uh, the war was wrapping down. They were ready to go into production. They couldn't spend two years hiring some high-priced industrial designer like Raymond Lowy or Henry Dreyfus or something like that. So they had to come up with something really quick. And since the Erie built was the same general size and proportions and weight, it was the perfect package. So General Electric brought in a man named Ray Patton from their appliance division. Now, appliances is not heavy electrical stuff. Appliances is like toasters. And if you look at the, de the details on a PA, like the grilled headlight, it looks like something you would have seen on a World War II era GE toaster. There's a reason behind that. It's because the guy that designed the toaster also designed the locomotive. There were three different models built over a seven year period. More than 65 feet long, 14 feet high, and 11 feet wide, the PA with its smooth curves dominated the track. Used by more than a dozen different railroads, the PAs could cruise 100 miles an hour. It was fuel injected and turbocharged. It weighed more than 300,000 pounds and could generate more than 2,000 horsepower. It was so popular that in 1947, it was chosen to head the Freedom Train, which carried some of the nation's most cherished documents on a year-long 200-city tour. Alco designed the PA around the concept of their single, powerful 244 engine, which had been developed during the war. Alco was quick to point out that a single engine meant fewer working parts and thus lower maintenance. But engine technology advanced rapidly. General Electric became an Alco competitor, and General Motors already was, so the last PA was built in the early 1950s. The first 244 was put into a customer's locomotive before the prototype had even gone through a 600-hour teardown test. So they'd never even tested this engine before they put it into a customer's locomotive. The 244 engine was a pretty good engine until it started to wear, which usually took two to three years. Well, within two to three years, Alco had sold a whole bunch of engines. And then the plague struck railroading called 244-itis, where suddenly all the 244s started failing at once. The General Motors locomotives in that era all were powered by two 1,000 horsepower 12-cylinder uh, engines. In passenger service, the railroads liked the twin engines. If you had a major failure with one engine, you're dead on the road. If you have a major failure with two engines, your likelihood is you can still have one engine drag the train in. In the early 50s, Alco actually proposed a PA-4 containing a 251 engine. 
but because the market was dying for passenger power at that time, Amtrak was on the verge, uh, everybody was trying to get out of the passenger business, there simply was no market left for a new passenger diesel. By the late 1960s, most of the Alco PAs were gone. Today, only a few are known to exist worldwide. One belongs to restoration expert and Alco lover, Doyle McCormick, who we first met back in 2000 when he acquired the rusted out remains. He told us then the rebuild would be the realization of a lifelong dream and a memorial to his father. What you're looking at here is the remains of probably one of the classiest diesel locomotives ever built. This is an Alco PA, or like I say, the remains thereof. And my intention is to make this look as good as the day it come out of the factory eventually. Put my heart and soul into it and most of my bank account too. The PAs hold a special place in my, my heart, if you want to call it that. Like I said, my dad worked for the nickel plate and got me hooked on trains at an early age. In 1955, he made a trip to New York City and took me with him. And we went down to the depot to get on the train. And he took me up and we rode the engine of nickel plate number eight from Connie out to Buffalo, which is 116 miles. The engine on that train was a nickel plate PA number 190. That was the first diesel locomotive I ever rode. And from that point on, that became a special engine in my, you know, my passion. If you look at the lines of these and the architecture and the design, they just say speed. You know, the curves, you don't see curves in, in industrial equipment today. Everything's box square corners. These have the nice lines, the curves, they're sleek. They got the long wheelbase trucks under them. They just look like something that wants to get out and run at 100 miles an hour. They have a face on them that only a mother could love, I guess. But uh, to a lot of the rail fans, these are the epitome of the diesel locomotive. It has been a slow and painstaking process, but today the rebirth of a legend is well underway. She is now painted in the bluebird color scheme of the old nickel plate railroad. And bolt by bolt, he's trying to get her track ready. Now what do you do with it? If it never runs, so be it. The object of this game is to preserve it and restore it. You know, when I get it done, nice day like this, I just want to pull it outside, get my lawn chair, my cooler with a six pack of Pepsi, the umbrella, and just sit there and watch it all day long. Just look at it, admire it. That's the object of the exercise here is the restoration and the preservation. Life is way too short. If you have a dream, chase it. It's, it's, you can't get old and say, I wish I had. You gotta get old and say, I'm glad I did. The Alco is a reminder of a time not so long ago when diesel replaced steam. A time when a young Doyle McCormick rode in the cab of the nickel plate with his dad. On Doyle's to-do list is the refurbishing of a second PA for the Smithsonian. It's planned that this one will have the famous Santa Fe war bonnet paint scheme. Now, Californians are used to seeing Hollywood movies being shot wherever they go. Let's meet Eric Michelson, who can recreate that experience every day in his own backyard. The director yells, action. A stuntman crashes a car into a gas station, which explodes upon impact. Then, it's on to the next scene. This isn't a rehearsal for the next Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie. It's just one of many wacky animated scenes in Eric Michelson's backyard train station. And if you look closely enough, you'll spot Arnold dancing the tango with someone who looks suspiciously like Jamie Lee Curtis. Eric's love of trains goes back to his first Lionel set, which his grandfather gave him when he was only one month old. Throughout my childhood, I enjoyed trying to ruin my trains with uh, firecrackers. Uh, running over tomato bugs, uh, building things on the track to try to crash them, run them as fast as you can, of course, uh, and they go flying off the tracks, and that, uh, that train still runs today. Eric has always gone to extreme measures to enhance his layout, even when he was a kid working on his original HO models. Sometimes things got a little out of hand. I needed lighting on my layout. And uh, because it just wasn't right, I put the roads in and a few buildings. But uh, of course, I didn't have any electrical expertise yet. So I took birthday candles and I put them all over the layout and I lit them. And I was so pleased when my father came home, I ran him out to the garage to, to see how this was all lit and candles. And he about had a heart attack because he was storing gasoline and 
paint thinners and all kinds of explosives in the garage that, of course, I had no idea about. Well, that explains the stunt car driver. Growing up in Southern California must have had a big influence on Eric. From the moment you step into his backyard, you wonder if you're in Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm or even a Hollywood movie set. And the Duke himself is there to greet you. The trains start out in Burbank, go over the San Gabriel Mountains, through the San Fernando Valley, down to San Diego, past Catalina Island, up to Santa Monica, and then back up to Burbank. Along the way, they pass recognized landmarks and some features that only Eric knows, such as the house he grew up in, or a tongue-in-cheek tribute to a commodities broker he once worked with. A couple of my friends and I paid tremendous commissions to a particular commodities broker, and we figured the way to get even was to hang him off the building, and uh, so that's got a lot of meaning for me. I've often said regarding my sense of humor, particularly in the layout, if you are uh, conservative-minded, you'll appreciate all my humor. Uh, if you're uh, more to the liberal side, uh, you'll have to tolerate my humor. We have the Blue Diamond Match Factory, where we have O-scale people making full-size matches. I enjoy the animation primarily because it's a challenge to create the standalone dioramas that sort of tell a story in and of themselves. And I enjoy the, uh, the mechanical aspects of the animation more so really than, than running trains. The trains basically tie in from animation to animation. With everything going on here, how does Eric direct a viewer's attention from one crazy animation to the next? He does it with sound. There are six audio cassette players hardwired into the layout with speakers placed at different locations. Eric can fade the sounds in and out, depending on what he wants his visitors to focus on. I would say the most rewarding part of the whole layout is the general um, reaction people get when they, they first see the buildings outside, and then once they walk inside, and I've obviously set up the whole scene, so it, they, they enter as a night scene, and they see all the lights and the trains running and all the animation, and it's, they, they get all excited, and then and then past that point when they start seeing all the little details and they start reading signs that, uh, that they may have been here four or five times before they realize that sign was ever there and they, they start busting a gut about it. Sometimes guests of the train station have to look up to get another surprise. Eric takes photos of people and creates banners for a remote control airplane to pull along a track high above the trains. This one is his nod to tracks ahead. Eric has replaced his audio cassette units with a state-of-the-art sound system. In a moment, we'll meet with Dan and Diddy Markoff, who have created a new chapter for both themselves and the Wild West legends they admire with their loving restoration of the Eureka steam locomotive. But right now, let's escape the hustle and bustle of city life and take in the serenity of the majestic Allegheny Mountains of West Virginia. Here you'll find some of the finest scenery in America, mountains, forests, lakes, and the trains of the wonderful Durban and Greenbrier Valley Railroad. Here in the mountains of West Virginia, you'll find some of the most breathtaking scenery in America. Hundreds of thousands of acres of unspoiled wilderness. Waterfalls cascade in densely forested canyons. Some of the most isolated and picturesque views you'll ever encounter. Durban is nestled in the Allegheny Mountain Range in Pocahontas County, West Virginia. Railroad history is in the bloodline of this town. The railroad really made the major impact 100 years ago in, in 1902. When the first train came to town, um, it came here to the depot. It was a steam engine, of course. And the town shifted back around from the, where the Western Maryland is now to where the Main Street is here. And so the railroad had first dibs and the town revolved around the railroad. For years, the railroad gave life to this town. But after nearly a century, it was the town, with financial assistance from the state, that would breathe new life into the abandoned line of a dying railroad. And it was determined that a small tourist operation could be started here if somebody's interested. And my wife Kathy and I decided that uh, we might be interested. So as ex-truck drivers, we sold our truck and formed the Durban and Greenbrier Valley Railroad Incorporated. 
about half of the businesses in town own are the original stockholders. The excursion trains of the Durban and Greenbrier Valley Railroad offer you some absolutely wonderful ways to see what West Virginia has to offer. Depending on how much time you have, the Durban and Greenbrier offers you a number of options. The Durban Rocket allows you to ease on down into the upper reaches of the Greenbrier River from the base of Cheat Mountain. The train is powered by Old Number 3, a nearly 100-year-old 55-ton Climax steam locomotive. It's one of the few operating geared Climax logging locomotives which remain. We could start with our steam locomotive, Climax Number 3. Uh, Climax is the name of the company that built it in Cory, Pennsylvania. They went out of business in 1929. Uh, they built geared logging locomotives as the, uh, these would be considered, let's say, the Volkswagen of geared logging locomotives as opposed to the Shays, which would be the Cadillacs. And so a lot of operations bought them that were low cost and low budget operations, uh, one of which was Moore Keppel Company, uh, located over the mountains in, in West Virginia, Ellamore, West Virginia. And our Climax uh, served there for about 60 years. We recovered it from a, a collection in Connecticut and put it back in service. It's one of right now two that operate. There's a possibility of maybe five that would operate in the world at any given time. And there's about 20 of them left. So there's not too many of them that are remaining in the world. Old number three rolls along the free flowing Greenbrier and she'll cover the 10 mile trip in about two hours. Now the Cheat Mountain Salamander is just plain fun. It covers 80 miles on two routes without ever leaving its wilderness home. It rolls on the highest mainline track east of the Mississippi. You'll ride through areas of extreme isolation. You'll bend around some of the tightest mainline curves in the United States. You'll see the beautiful and inspirational high falls of Cheat Mountain, hidden deep in the river valley, and one of West Virginia's most magnificent waterfalls. All this while riding a custom-built and self-propelled rail car. It's a replica of a 1922 Edwards Railway motor car, built just for this rugged mountain service. Salamander is a reproduction of an Edwards motorized rail car. They used them in small communities where they didn't have enough people to warrant a full-time passenger train, but people wanted to travel from town to town. Roads weren't too well established. Rail was a better way to travel, and it was basically a bus that runs on the railroad tracks. The smooth riding and mountain climbing new Tigered Flyer offers longer trips, some lasting nearly eight hours. You journey deep into the wilderness for a pampered, stylish, and climate-controlled ride. On the agenda are wonderful views of deep canyons, dense forests, and the Tigert Valley River. The new Tigert Flyer is another segment of our tourist operation that operates on another piece of the West Virginia Central. It operates on about 75 miles of that line, and um, it's a streamlined, old-fashioned Pullman car passenger train. We feel like that uh, we only exist because of the goodwill of the people of West Virginia. These are lines that are owned by the state of West Virginia, and uh, some of the funding on the West Virginia Central to keep the lines up comes from uh, state, the state legislature. And so this state is able to do things that the surrounding states should be doing but, but aren't. So West Virginia, in a way, is benefiting because of its own attitude toward rail lines and because of the people's attitude toward uh, you know, having something like this and preserving rail lines, there's a tremendous amount of, um, of goodwill that we've enjoyed doing this. And so it becomes a fun thing to do. We have 290 stockholders, are all local people, and they've invested in a railroad that they knew would, they'd never get a dollar out of, but yes, last year we paid a, a, a dividend for the first time, and, and it looks like we're gonna do the same thing again. So something that looked like it was just a lark has turned into a legitimate enterprise and it has a bright future. Every year, tens of thousands of visitors make the trek here to ride the trains of the Durban and Greenbrier. After a visit, West Virginia might just feel like home, or at least you'll wish it was home. But one thing is for sure, when you see beauty like this, you'll definitely want to come back. There wouldn't have been a Wild West if it hadn't been for the railroads. And for many of us, our images of the West were based on scenes from the movies. This is the story of the Eureka, a restored wood-burning engine that played a role in creating both the real and the imaginary frontier. 
the Eureka is only one of three 440 wood-burning engines in existence today. One is in the Smithsonian. This one is in Dan Markoff's backyard. Built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in the 1870s, she ran between the silver mining town of Eureka and the Central Pacific's mainline connection at Palisade, Nevada until 1901. At some point, the Eureka was sold for scrap to a Bay Area salvage company and was forgotten for years until it caught train historian Gerald Best's eye and went to the Warner Brothers Film Studio. While Warner Brothers owned the Eureka, she appeared in many Hollywood films and television shows, including John Wayne's last movie, The Shootist. But in the 1970s, the old Hollywood studio system started to die. The Eureka was all but forgotten and sold to the owners of the old Vegas theme park. And there she sat, waiting for the next act in her career. That's when Dan Markoff came along. Somehow he connected with that wreckage and the next thing I know, he walks in the door and he says, we have a locomotive. And I said, okay, well, every boy should have his hobbies. Having known of the history of the locomotive somewhat, it was discouraging to see it in such sad condition. I figured if nobody cared for it, maybe I could and put it back in, uh, in shape. So that's what went off in my mind when I, when I saw the thing after it had been burnt up. It was just to preserve a piece of, of our Western history. Dan laid a few hundred feet of track in his backyard and built a special structure to house the Eureka during its renovation. Luckily, the original Baldwin blueprints were still available and helped Dan avoid a lot of guesswork while he restored the engine. The Eureka's intricate Victorian adornments were painstakingly recreated. The wagon top boiler's whistle, sandbox, and bell are crowned with acorn finials. The original decorations, colors, and lettering were matched and required a substantial amount of gold leaf. I never thought I'd be living with a train in my backyard. I always thought I'd have an in-ground pool and instead we have a railroad. Uh, the deal was I would get a patio if he got the locomotive. I never thought it would come to this though, but I'm pretty proud of him. But it's not enough for the Eureka to sit in the Markov's backyard. She's taken real runs at least once a year for the past 13 years. This year, the Eureka will return to the Durango and Silverton line in Colorado. Firing up the Eureka with enough wood to handle steep climbs is no small task and requires a lot of teamwork. But no one is more surprised than Diddy at how much fun it is. I never envisioned this, and it took the first seven years of our marriage, but I am so proud of this I cannot begin to tell you. It's an extraordinary experience to be able to do this. I don't think there's any other female in the country who gets to do this. Have a date with her husband in a steam locomotive. The engine has also returned to her birthplace in Eureka, Nevada for special occasions. We had it up there in 1992. They brought this very old woman by who was very frail. They brought her up and we gave her this little ride down the, the track that we had built. And uh, she started crying. And I asked her what was wrong and she said, as a young girl, this locomotive had pulled her in a train to school and it was bringing back her youth to her. And uh, it, was, it was one of the most special moments I've ever had with this locomotive, to have that, that bridge of uh, almost a century there. Seeing how people react to the Eureka is a testament to its beauty and grace, and to the railroad's ability to capture the romance of the Old West. They're inspired, I see tears in their eyes, that inspires me and I appreciate the engine more each time I see that. They sincerely appreciate history, um, they appreciate what Dan has done. It's better than H.G. Wells' time machine. It's not only carrying you back into the time of the 1870s and 1880s of the American West, it's something that's going on today also. It's, so it's not just, it's running in the past that, that that's interesting and learning how they did it then, it's that it's running today in the 21st century also. Dan is continuing to work on additional rolling stock for his railroad. That's it for this episode. Thanks for being with us and please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead. <laughs>